The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Witt. I'm the staff attorney for the Colorado Municipal League. Thank you for attending today's webinar entitled Local Government Authority Over Wireless Facilities. Colorado attorneys and judges who attend the entire webinar may claim one general continuing legal education credit. Because this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website, we will not share the course ID in the presentation. We will instead email the course ID to attendees following the webinar. Elected officials in attendance today will receive one university training credit. The PowerPoint presentation and the webinar recording will be posted on our website at www.cml.org under training materials by the end of the week. For those of you who are not familiar with the webinar format, you should see a control panel on the top right of the screen. You have an orange arrow to the left of the panel, which will minimize the entire box. All participants will be muted for the webinar, but are encouraged to ask questions by typing them in to the question box on the control panel. We will hold a Q&A near the end of the webinar, but please feel free to type the questions in as you think of them throughout the presentation. Our presenters today are Ken Fellman, Gerald Dahl, and Leslie Gaylord. I'm going to read their speaker bios before we begin. First up we will have speaking is Ken Fellman. Ken is a partner at the Denver law firm of Kissinger and Fellman PC. For 38 years, he has worked with local governments nationwide in connection with technology, communications, broadband, and public safety communications issues. Ken has provided communications and broadband consulting services to CML, state chapters of the NATOA in Colorado, Washington, and New Jersey the Association of Washington Cities, the Association of Idaho Cities, and the National League of Cities. He is currently serving as legal counsel for local governments in Colorado, Washington, and Florida, challenging the FCC's 2018 Small Wireless Facilities Order. Ken served as mayor of Arvada, Colorado from 1999 to 2007, and has testified on communications matters before the U.S. Congress and the Colorado General Assembly. For the past 10 years, Ken was named as one of Law & Politics Colorado Super Lawyers. Alyssa represents the top 5% of Colorado attorneys. Ken received his bachelor's from John Hopkins University and his law degree from the University of Denver. He can be contacted, you see his contact information on the screen in front of you, but he can also be contacted via telephone at 303-320-6100. Then we have Jerry Dahl as a presenter. Jerry Dahl is a partner with the firm Murray Dahl Berry and Renowned LLP. Jerry is a local government law attorney representing municipalities and counties statewide. His practice specializes in land use, annexation, conflicts of interest, and public officials' roles and responsibilities. He is a past general counsel for the Colorado Municipal League. He is a city attorney for Wheat Ridge and town attorney for Georgetown, Morrison, Poncha Springs, Colorado. And finally, we will have presenting with us Leslie Gaylord. Leslie currently works for the city of Aurora. Prior to working for the city, Leslie spent 15 years working for the United States military as a marketing director, supporting wounded warriors, families of the fallen and community leaders as a liaison for transitioning military members. Ms. Gaylord started with the City of Aurora in September of 2018 as the telecommunications support for fiber and small cell installation. At this time, I will be handing it over to Ken. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see if I can get the screen to work. Well, are you sure you gave me control of the screen? There we go. Okay, so let me start off uh, this way. I want to thank um, my colleagues, Joe Van Eaton and Jerry Letterer. These are uh, attorneys in Washington, D.C. that I'm working with on the appeal of the FCC rules, and they did a presentation recently at the IMLA conference. Some of you may have seen it, um, and they graciously agreed to allow me to uh, use some of the information in their slides. Uh, in my presentation. So what we're going to cover today, at least in uh, my part of the talk, is a little bit about Colorado statute dealing with small cell facilities, the FCC's recent orders. Um, I'm going to probably spend the meat of this of my time talking about the conflicts between our state law and the FCC rules, and uh, then I'll give you a brief status of the uh, court challenge to the FCC rules. So first with our state law, House Bill 171193. Um, I've given you the two sections of the CRS where uh, it is codified. Uh, the big picture issues here are these small cells are now a use by right in any zone district throughout the state. 
um, but they are subject to all local police powers, and that includes our zoning authority. Our statute defines what a small cell and what small cell facilities are. We're going to talk more about that as we go through the presentation. Um, uh, it applies the shot clock that the uh, FCC had previously uh, come up with for wireless facilities that is now codified in our state law, and it allows for batched applications where companies can file uh, multiple sites within one application. I, just to point out a little bit about the legislative history here, our bill is a result of um, some significant collaboration between local governments and the wireless industry. Uh, and it was that was done at the request, or some might say at the demand of the sponsor of the bill. But she is a legislator who uh, has a lot of respect for local control uh, and, and, and really helped us get to some compromises that we can live with. There are uh, 20 some state laws right now that deal with small cells. And I hesitate to say that ours is the best of these state laws because I just don't like to use the word best in connection with these bills. Because frankly, we didn't think any bill was necessary. But I, I would say this, ours sucks the least compared to the other states. So let's see if we can move this thing on. All right, now it's not moving. There we go. Um, the um, statute authorizes the use of local government structures and the rights of way, light poles, standards, traffic signals. Um, it does not limit fees for what local governments are allowed to uh, charge uh, for attaching to government owned poles unless those fees would be limited if uh, regulated under Section 224 of the uh, Communications Act. Section 224 authorizes uh, what are known as the federal pole attachment rules. Um, generally, those pole attachment rules do not apply to local government owned poles unless state law says they do, and in, in our case, it does. I, I would tell you that it's not 100% clear to me and many others that the Section 224 rules apply to wireless attachments. Those rules primarily apply to wired attachments. So if you've got CenturyLink wanting to put a wire on an XL-owned pole, um, we have federal rules that deal, that deal with what can be charged. I think it's probably unlikely that at least some in the wireless industry think that 224 currently applies to small cell facilities. I've, I've seen some of the attachment agreements that some of those companies have with utility companies, and they don't seem to be limiting what they charge each other. So while our statute limits us under 224, I don't think 224 really applies. Um, the FCC orders, we, a lot of people are talking about an order singular. There are actually are three of them that relate to small cells, um, although I'm going to spend most of the time talking with the, about the third one. Just briefly, though, uh, there is one that basically excludes small cells from uh, uh, NEPA and NHPA. Uh, there's a second one that, from a local government standpoint, primarily deals with the issue of moratoria. And the big one is uh, the September order from last year. On, um, on small cells, and we'll focus most of our attention on that. But just very briefly, um, last March, the FCC came out with a rule that basically said small cells are not federal undertakings, and therefore um, they are no longer addressed as a major federal action under the National Historic Preser Preservation Act or under the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, they are still subject under that rule to state and local government approval. Um, there are a number of parties who have appealed that. Um, a lot of the Native American tribes are, are not happy with this order. And um, that was briefed and argued, and we're awaiting a decision there. The uh, moratoria order that came out last August, um, it, it actually did two things, but one doesn't really impact local governments. Uh, it, it interpreted the prohibition in the Telecom Act that says our local regulations cannot prohibit or effectively prohibit the ability to provide telecom service um, in a way that basically said moratoria, outright moratoria on siting wireless facilities or even de facto moratoria are prohibitions of the ability to provide service and violate federal law and are therefore preempted by federal law. So some of the examples that were used in that docket, freeze and frost laws, 
Um, Michigan, I know, has a statute that certain conditions in the winter you're not allowed to be uh, digging in the streets or impacting the streets. Um, this rule would preempt that. Um, I think there's a, a law that in places like Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina, during hurricane season, you can't be trenching in the streets and closing down lanes of traffic because they have to keep those routes open in the event of a hurricane. Um, this FCC rule would preempt those kind of laws. Um, that issue is, or this rule is being appealed and has not yet been briefed. And it's in the Ninth Circuit. The city of Portland, Oregon is the main party there. So to the big issue, the small cell order that came out last September, it also relied on the same interpretation from the moratoria order as to what it means to prohibit or effectively prohibit service under both um, the two applicable sections of the Telecom Act. And uh, they basically said, I'm somewhat generalizing here, but if, if a regulation materially inhibits the ability of a company to not just provide service, but even improve or expand service, uh, that it would amount to an effective prohibition under federal law. Um, and it created a number of tests to see whether that standard was met. Um, some relate to fees, some to aesthetics, aesthetic uh, regulations, undergrounding issues, spacing requirements. Um, uh, it created cost caps for the regulatory fees that we charge um, that interestingly apply both for in and outside of the rights of way. Uh, they came up with caps for what you could um, rent uh, local government assets within the rights of way. Um, created new shot clocks, shorter shot clocks for small cells, and redefined what it means to uh, co-locate facilities. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Basically, this this new interpretation that came out in the small cell order um, is consistent with some case law in some federal circuits and inconsistent with case law in other federal circuits. And we will talk about that too when we get to the appeal. Um, uh, so now let's talk about the conflicts. Um, it's To me, one of the key issues here is right at the beginning of the FCC order, it recognized that there were at that time 20 state small cell laws in existence. And it said that the FCC order preempts almost none of the provisions in any of those state laws. Now, in the next 100 pages of the order, they never tell us exactly what they are preempting. So when you say we're preempting almost none, that suggests to me that you are preempting something, but they never exactly tell us what. Um, the, um, uh, they changed the definition of uh, co-location. Under our state law, co-location, and, and actually under prior FCC laws dealing with the mandatory co-location rules, um, it involves mounting equipment on a structure, it could be in the right of way, outside of the right of way, that has already been approved for some kind of wireless attachments and has that equipment already deployed. So you're co-locating onto a facility that already has been approved and has existing telecom facilities. Under these new rules last September, if you mount equipment on any pre-existing structure, um, even structures that have not yet been approved or have any wireless facilities on them, you're co-locating. So basically, if you're adding a wireless facility to a structure that's used for something else, under these new rules, that's co-location. Um, under our state law, we define what a small cell is. The antenna themselves have to fit within an, an, an imaginary enclosure or a real enclosure of no more than three cubic feet. And then the other primary equipment that goes with it, no more than 17 cubic feet, although there are some exceptions that don't fall into that category. Um, and whatever the height is would be subject to local zoning. The, under the FCC rules, we've got three cubic feet for the antenna, but the total equipment, no more than 28 cubic feet. Um, it also says these can be located on structures of up to 50 feet in the rights of way and still be considered small cells or even increase existing height uh, 10 percent more than something that's there now so you can presumably have over 50 feet uh, a pole over 50 feet and still be a small cell under the um, under the federal law um, it, my interpretation on that last point is that the FCC doesn't mandate that you must allow 50 feet 
But if the FCC rules stand, I think this is a matter that is probably going to be litigated at some point. The uh, state shot clock, we have 90 days to whether it's a location or co-location for small cell network facilities. And there's a provision if we have an incomplete application, uh, we notify the applicant within 30 days. The shot clock, stop, shot clock stops. The FCC rules say that if you're co-locating small cells, so you're adding something to a street light pole, 60 days. Um, if you're putting up a brand new facility, 90 days. Uh, and then they have different ways uh, that you can notify uh, that would stop the shot clock and when it would start if the application is is incomplete. So some minor but still substantively different provisions of how the state shot clock works versus the FCC shot clock. Um, to me, um, I, I have to note the irony of the last bullet point here. The FCC has said if you ha if you mandate a pre-application conference, and as most of you know, we have pre-application conferences for lots of different kinds of land uses, not just wireless facilities, and they are very beneficial and they usually result in better applications being filed and not having to be kicked back for being incomplete. But if you have a requirement for a pre-app conference, under the FCC rules, that starts the shot clock. So you have this crazy situation where the time to act on an application, the clock starts running before you actually have an application to review. Um, how do we address that? I, some folks are doing it differently. I, I have been advising people, uh, make your pre-application conferences uh, for this single kind of land use optional. And if the applicant chooses to have a pre-app conference, they got to sign something to acknowledge that the shot clock doesn't start until they actually file their application. Um, permit fees and license fees. Uh, we are no strangers to having um, our fees be limited to actual costs incurred by the local government. That's been the law in Colorado for a long time. Um, again, for um, all kinds of fees, not just for uh, wireless, uh, the pole attachment fees under state law. Um, as I mentioned, we can't um, uh, charge more than whatever section 224 of the federal law requires, but I don't think it requires anything right now. So that would be kind of an open issue uh, for charging what you want. The FCC rules, on the other hand, when it comes to fees, um, uh, says that you can't charge more than your cost, but they create a legal presumption that your non-recurring permit or license fees the maximum amount is $500. And if it's more than $500, um, it is presumed to materially inhibit and therefore prohibit the ability to provide service in violation for federal law. And they said it's $500 for a single upfront application, including up to five facilities and 100 bucks more for each additional one, or $1,000 for, uh, for new poles uh, where you're not doing a co-location. Um, they also capped what you can charge for attaching to a local government owned facility at $270 per pole per year. Um, the $500 cap is for all fees. So think of your application fee, a license fee, a building permit fee. If there's a lane closure fee for the work that they're doing, all of those total if they're over $500. Um, here's the biggest problem I think here, this, there's this legal presumption if you exceed the cap, um, you are exceeding your actu uh, actual costs and prohibiting the ability to pro provide service. What is the primary thing that goes into determining cost? Well, it's the cost of labor. And for the FCC to come up with a one size fits all cap, whether it's $500 or $5,000, that assumes that the cost of labor in New York City is the same as the cost of labor in Ray, Colorado, and we know that um, that's not the case. So that's one of the issues that, of course, is going to be addressed in the um, appeal. Um, on the um, use of, of property, local government property in the right of way, um, we do have a state law that um, mandates that, but it's subject to local police powers, which would include um, zoning, it would include public safety issues. I'm aware of some communities that have said, well, you can use some of our traffic signals, but if we have public safety equipment on some and there's potential for interference, we're not letting you go on this particular signal. 
the FCC rules don't reference anything to do with police power or public safety requirements. And um, if they are upheld, if the FCC rules are upheld, I can pretty much guarantee that um, the conflict here will end up in litigation somewhere. Uh, aesthetics are another big issue. I put a couple of uh, photographs here. We would mostly prefer to see the kinds of sites on the left as opposed to the one on the right. Um, under state law, there's nothing that restricts our ability to address aesthetics. Under federal law, we can adopt aesthetic requirements if they meet the three standards that you see on that slide. Um, what it means to be objectively reasonable, I don't know. If the FCC order is upheld, that will be litigated. Um, no more burdensome than applied to other types of infrastructure. The problem I see here is the other similar infrastructure that we have in the streets are street light poles and traffic signals. And it has not been our practice in the past to impose aesthetic requirements on those. Does that mean that if you don't do that, you can't impose aesthetic requirements on small wireless facilities on those same poles? No one is quite sure. That would be litigated as well. Um, some folks have asked me, what does it mean to be uh, objective and published in advance? Uh, there's no real requirement in the rules. If you put them on your website, if you have them in your code, if you have separate design standards that you have available in writing or on your website, anything will work if it's in writing and available to the public. Now, some communities have been scrambling over the last few weeks before because the part of the rule that said you have to have these aesthetic requirements published um, went into effect on Monday of this week. If you are not done with that yet, I would encourage you to put it in your get this done as fast as you can um, pile because that really needs to be done. Uh, just a few other things real quickly. I don't want to take up too much of everybody else's time. Um, one of the things we're allowed to do under state law, if it's appropriate, is require undergrounding of these facilities. I've given you some examples of what the ground facilities might look like. The FCC rule specifically says that even if it's, if it's legal under state law, it might be a prohibition under federal law to require undergrounding, but they don't get into much more detail. Um, separation spacing requirements, we're allowed to do that under state law. Um, it's an aesthetic issue to avoid pole clutter. The FCC rules say that spacing requirements might be preempted if they're not deemed to be objectively reasonable. So there's that, uh, those two words again, that if the FCC rules are upheld, um, will sure to be litigated uh, some places around the country. Um, so what's happening now with, with those rules? Uh, there are many local governments, including the Colorado Communications and Utility Alliance, which many of your communities are members of, um, that have challenged those rules in federal court. Uh, some of the issues that are raised is that the statutory interpretation uh, that the FCC made was improper, that it wasn't based on evidence in the record. We have APA claims. Uh, there are 10th and 5th Amendment violation claims. A bunch of industry folks have also uh, appealed claiming only that the FCC should have gone further and adopted a deemed granted remedy um, if a local government violated the shot clock, um, which would have been an even further intrusion in having the FCC sort of impose themselves as the local zoning authority. So those are some of the key issues in the appeal. It was originally assigned to the 10th Circuit um, through the federal lottery system but it is now pending in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, there's a long, boring story for how that happened, but the ultimate result is that that's good for us. Um, when it was still in the Tenth Circuit, uh, a motion for stay of these rules was filed at the FCC first, and then in the Tenth Circuit, that motion was denied. Um, then it got transferred to the Ninth Circuit. The FCC has filed a motion to hold the case in abeyance until it rules on a recon motion. That's a very minor issue in the case. There's a case management conference in federal court in San Francisco tomorrow where the abeyance issue is going to be resolved as well as hopefully the court will give us a briefing schedule and we hope to be able to um, have our uh, briefing and our oral argument expedited and done by the fall because the sooner we can get these issues resolved, especially um, some understanding of how the conflict with state law is going to be resolved, uh, the better for all of us in our ability to cite these things. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Jerry and let him take it from here. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Right hand on this to, to advance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, other one. 
Yeah. Sorry. Thanks, Ken. Uh, uh, we all, I know, appreciate Ken's uh, work at the level he's working at because most of us local government attorneys, that, the ones that, that are representing cities, don't have the time, frankly, neither do our clients, to keep track of the just rapidly changing technology that, you, that, that is happening and the rapidly changing legal environment that uh, Ken just described. My practice, of course, is almost exclusively for local government for cities and a number of small cities. And I will say that the, the, the challenges that, that we share with industry uh, are that we have this rapidly changing technology and legal environment. Imagine if you're uh, a, a small a town with a population of 1,000, you've got, if you're lucky, one planner on staff, quite likely you have to contract that out, and you just finished doing what you felt you should do, which is to revise your regulations on small cells and adopt them consistent with, with the state statute 1193, and you just finished that within the last year. And uh, now you hear that uh, the FCC has uh, potentially preempted that, and I've been making some notes just kind of thinking about it as Ken was speaking. There's probably half a dozen things at least that even with a really good 1193 compliant small cell reg, you now need to change. But do you change that now? Or do you wait until uh, the litigation's over? Will it ever be over? So. Uh, from from someone who represents uh, cities sort of in the trenches, especially small cities, that's a real concern for them. Uh, how much money do you spend and when do you spend it to keep your regulations uh, current with whatever the current environment is? That's a huge challenge. Uh, cities and industry both face increased customer demand. Uh, from the industry, of course, the, the, we've seen the graphs in terms of the amount of, of, of bandwidth that that their customers are demanding and the speed they're demanding is pushing them to demand these facilities. At the same time, we respond to our residents in local governments and they they want the same thing. And if the city's in the way, they're gonna they're gonna complain to the city. The, we I think both industry and, this, and uh, municipalities, local governments, share the, the goal of having a fair and efficient review process. We want it to be fair. We want it to be efficient. On the local government side, we don't want to, don't want to spend additional money uh, having to, to uh, chase regulations around. But we do have unique problems at the local government level that aren't shared with industry. I believe that our one of our concerns, of course, is reducing visual clutter. And with the greatest respect, that's not a concern to industry. And you saw some of the pictures. Uh, I think that we have visually uh, attractive structures, not because industries wants to have them, but because, of course, we've demanded them. And, uh, you know, our citizens want no visual clutter, and they also want uh, service. So that's, that's a conflict. We have to preserve public safety. Again, this is a concern more for local government than industry, with the greatest respect to industry. They're not going to be that concerned about, and they're not thinking about the uh, the pole in the right of way, and whether and to what extent that's really going to affect a side triangle, whether or to what extent that's going to affect uh, the local government's ADA requirements for sidewalks. Uh, these are the things that we have to care about. Of course, we have to respect the wishes of our citizens who, again, want the service, but they don't want the clutter and they want to be able to move on sidewalks and streets safely. That brings me to the maintaining the appropriate use of the public rights of way. Uh, interestingly, Everyone wants a piece of the right of way. Be why? Because it's free. Uh, if uh, you're going to ask for an easement uh, or the right to put a pole on private property, you're going to have to pay for it. You're going to have to pay quite a market rate. Uh, public rights of way are free. They've been free, more or less, for other utilities for a long time, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't be. We encourage and ask for uh, utilities and traditionally always have water, sewer, electric, gas, shallow utilities, cable, in the old days, cable, uh, electricity, telephone, in rights of way because that is an efficient place to put them. That's what rights of way are for in part. In fact, we hold rights of way and trust for the public. And so I'm not adverse to saying that 
Service to the public includes now, in today's world, wireless facilities. Now, nevertheless, it's it's um, sort of a rush to see how much you can put in the right of way because that's that's cheaper. But nevertheless, we have an obligation from a public service, public safety standpoint, to 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 make certain that the the use of the rights of way are appropriate. Uh, Ken's mentioned the issue about uh, costs, and one of, of course the unique problem local governments have is budgeting for all of this review, and it's going to be very difficult not impossible to budget all that within the $500 and $1,000 uh, caps that, that Ken mentioned. I see that as just a huge uh, impact on local government. Now, I am certain that it will inspire us all to look carefully at our review processes and make them even more uh, 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 streamlined and time efficient uh, so that we can save that labor cost that Ken uh, mentioned and that that's fine. We should operate as lean as we can, but that's going to be a real lean. Uh, the last bullet I put up here in terms of challenge for local government is one that that will never go away and maintain local land use control in an environment of of all sorts of preemption. And I appreciate Ken's work on uh, House Bill 1193, and I agree with him. Uh, the way I would characterize it, Ken, would be it's the least worst. <laughs> uh, of the uh, of the bills out there, and Ken warned me as it was going through the process that I wouldn't like it, and he was right. Uh, I didn't, but maintaining some kind of local land use control in in, in this environment is very difficult, and especially when you see the the environment as it's being changed by the FCC. So that's a real challenge for us. So what do we do about that? Well, we still have tools still until they're taken away. And those tools include the ones I've mentioned here. And, and uh, I've written a number of these regs, and I'm going to have to go out and think about what changes to make that are the right ones to make now without uh, making changes that are just going to have to be unwound and redone as this litigation moves forward. I'm going to have to work on what those are. But what are our tools? Clearly, zone district regulations. And we use zone district regulations locally to say where freestanding facilities can be. Uh, they typically not in residential districts, where uh, rooftop facilities can be, again, typically not in residential, possibly multifamily, some jurisdictions allow that, and then, of course, in commercial and in industrial. A bullet that isn't on this slide, but probably should be, would be uh, design standards, uh, which are different than zone district regulations. Uh, for screening, setback, height, these are typical standards we have. Uh, as regards screening, you know, most of our regulations that we've been adopting for small cells talk about requiring the small cell or a freestanding facility uh, to be adequately screened. Uh, and, of course, uh, Ken's description of where the FCC is coming from in terms of objective, objectively, objectively, sorry, reasonable aesthetic standards, because in my opinion, a screening standard is is an aesthetic standard. I, I think that that's probably a fair argument. And so, how do you make a screening standard objectable, uh, objectively reasonable? The kinds of uh, sub parts to our screening standards usually include color, texture, landscaping, architectural features, fencing. So it will be our challenge to articulate those requirements now in an objectively reasonable way. I'm not concerned about publishing them and making sure they're available in writing, we put them in our codes, and so they're available in writing, and we check that that box. But that's going to be a challenge for us. Uh, Ken mentioned co-location requirements and how those are uh, changing. Um, I think that that uh, that's a, another challenge for us, especially if, for co-location, normally that's a shorter review process. But as Ken mentions, co-location now can be on a structure that doesn't have any of those facilities. So if if it's co-location on a church spire that was built really as a church spire, and uh, now there's a facility desired to be on that church spire, and we have to review that as a co-location application, not as a new application. That's uh, going to be a challenge. Um, certainly in the regulations that I've written, we require insurance for facilities if they're going to be in the right-of-way. Again, think about it. You've got traffic. You've got pedestrians in the right-of-way. If there's injuries 
uh, resulting from a private facility in the right-of-way. We certainly want that covered. An area that, that I insist upon that isn't addressed as much as I would like was, would be what happens when you're done? What happens when you're no longer interested in this facility and technology has changed? Uh, at the time these facilities are installed, we get a lot of assurances. But uh, I, in my experience, have discovered that if the industry moves on and the technology moves on, it's expensive for them to remove facilities they're no longer interested in, or at least parts of those facilities. And it's important for the local regulations to have uh, uh, bonds for that, um, you know, insurances that there's, there's some kind of fund available. And if not, the ability in your code to bill the property owner whose property that was on and lien that property in order to collect. Uh, we talked a little bit about review process, and um, uh, typically the uh, distinction that I have made, and I think a lot of local governments make in, on the review process, is to distinguish between building and roof mounts that aren't a substantial change, uh, and for that matter, uh, small cells, uh, and you give them an opportunity for, admin, for administrative review, and you, you uh, allow yourself to go a lot faster there, and meet the shot clock, where you have a substantial change in a new freestanding facility, you have some choices to make regulatorily, even though you're constrained by the, the shot clock rules, I think. Uh, you have to decide whether it's a conditional use permit or a special use permit. Shouldn't be a use by right, unless perhaps you're in an industrial district or maybe a C2 heavy commercial district, you could make them a use by right. But honestly, our residents and our constituents expect a new freestanding facility that's uh, that's going to be in a, a zone district that's, that people are in frequently, they expect to have a review process there that gives them the right to attend and, uh, and address their local government. They expect that kind of facility to be uh, subject to a public hearing. And that, to me, means a uh, conditional use permit or special use permit. And that is going to run into uh, time frame constraints where we have a different view in the industry. So we talked about co-location already. Roof or stealth potential, increasingly the regulations are requiring new facilities to be stealth. Uh, that's probably also an aesthetic uh, requirement. And we're gonna have to look carefully at how we write those. I have plugged into the regulations requirement for photo simulations before and after, and I found that that's really helpful. You get a, uh, a simulation that is described as this is what we're going to build. Now you have a standard that you can hold that that um, uh, applicant to after it has been been built. Uh, requirement for a complete application uh, that connects up with Ken's point about the uh, pre-application uh, starting the shot clock. And I'm certainly going to be looking at the regulations I've written to to see how we define application and may take Ken's uh, point about, or his suggestion about making a pre-app optional. Bringing us to small cells themselves, they're, they're both opportunities and challenges, as, as I've admitted, but the, the, the thing that is, of course, the most worrisome to us, local governments, is the provision in 1193 that requires small cells to be a permitted use by right in any zone district. That, of course, is the state legislature making a local zoning decision, and, and I think everyone can appreciate how uh, uh, objectionable that is to us locally. We're not ever, we're rarely told that this is what uh, you must allow in a zone district. That's uh, central to local control. But having relieved myself of that uh, angst, I, I live in the real world, and now we have to work with that. And of course, uh, we've got some tools and if it's going to be required in the right of way as a use by right, uh, then in, increasingly we put together, I've put together and others have, as has Ken, a list of sort of the priorities that we're looking at here. Since we're not getting rent for this free use of the right of way, then the priority for, established for using that use by right in the right of way is, is, as I've indicated, or some priority, locally you can change your priorities. But the way I've designed it is give, build a new municipally owned pole that you'll give to us that contains all the equipment. And we've seen some very good examples of that. 
Door number two, or sort of in descending order of desirability, if you will, put it on an existing municipal unit pole in the right of way. Door number three, a third party pole in the right of way might be XL. Door number four, on a traffic signal, I have real issues with safety there, but, but uh, in a given case, it might be appropriate. Door number five, that's the last, on a new pole. Why? Because that's a new pole. And one of our concerns, of course, is visual clutter, and you want to be able to uh, uh, reduce that to the degree you can. That's why the list I've put together here uh, emphasizes existing structures. Uh, some more opportunities and challenges for small cells. Obviously, we want to avoid the mid-block and sidewalk locations because we've got ADA requirements, and we've all seen the pictures of that. Uh, considerations for us on small sales are the ones I've listed, and as you look through these, some of them clearly are aesthetic, aren't they, and are going to be affected one way or another with, uh, by virtue of how the, the FCC uh, rulings are uh, come out and whether or not they're upheld. Let me skip all the way to permitting process, and I want to make note of the revocable permit. Uh, you know, honestly, Many city home rule charters require in their charters that uh, the, the permits for the use of public land, rights of way, have to be revocable at the insistence of or at the discretion of the city council at any time. That's going to come into conflict, I think, with the permitting that the industry is, uh, is seeking. So I uh, have some challenges for industry uh, if they're listening, and I make sure I say this whenever I get a chance. Uh, you know, if you're going to ask to be a use by right in the right of way and be uh, a, 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 an allowed uh, participant, then become a participant in more than just asking for the approvals. Uh, participate in the local government comprehensive planning process because I've never, I've yet to see an industry representative at a cop plant uh, meeting ever. And that's where some of the decisions about where we want things to happen are made. Uh, participate in the development and adoption of the regulations. I have seen industry there. Uh, however, uh, I would appreciate if, if industry wouldn't, wouldn't over-represent the extent of federal and state preemption. The truth is there's a lot of it. Ken has mentioned it. Uh, but in the meetings I've been in, sometimes that gets overrepresented to a small locally elected board if the, the industry doesn't think that there's going to be pushback from people like Ken or me that might be in the room. Uh, obviously, I think there should be aggressive co-location, and I have mentioned already the uh, commitment to removal on abandonment, which is uh, enormously important. That takes me through, I believe, the things I had, and I think I can hand over to uh, yeah, to Leslie. Leslie? Yeah. Hello. All right, Leslie, you've got the keyboard and mouse. Go ahead when you're ready. There we go. Welcome, everyone. Um, I want to thank you for staying with us. Um, we are going to talk about what the city of Aurora is doing and how the city of Aurora is talking not only uh, to our city and our applicants, but how we're talking internally. One of the big things that we have come up with here and is one of the forefront pieces that we discuss is understanding those FCC rules and following them and their challenges. Knowing how to operate in those rules will not only make it successful for your applicant, your colleagues, but also within the infrastructure that you're asking them to build in. Um, the next piece is going to be knowing and understanding what are your city standards. Do you understand what they are? And what, again, we did in the city of Aurora was we started with the basics. Um, it was highlighted a little bit during the slides here, um, but really finding out what your infrastructure is, where it's placed, and who is managing it is some of the biggest key points and hurdles that uh, a lot of, I would say, people get stuck in, um, in finding out those details of what those expectations are. And if, as the municipality, you have those permissions um, to work within those guidelines. Using CDOT as the perfect right-of-way, a lot of municipalities have those um, 
conversations of who's managing what and um, who can pull the trigger first. Being transparent in uh, my department and my role here has made it very fluid, not only for myself to be able to work with the carriers, um, but being able to work internally in other departments because we've established those um, three basic rules of understanding what the FCC rules are, knowing who is managing them, um, and then being transparent with what those expectations are, which leads us to what Aurora does is collaboration, having one voice and managing that voice. Of course, one of the big things that you're going to have is who's working with you and who's working for you. Having that internal communication, one of the biggest questions that we ask internally is what is this workload that we're taking on inside these departments and can they handle the workload that's coming in with small cell? Um, understanding those roles of what we're asking them for and the time sensitivity of small cell and the installation is who in that department understands those requirements and whom are we holding accountable for making sure that we meet those deadlines? Um, have we looked internally about um, the, asset, uh, the assets that we are bringing to the staff? And can we provide them more assets for staff to be able to um, internally handle small cell? Most importantly, again, when you're talking about that internal and external communication, even though it's happening both ways, you are having two different conversations. So you want to make sure, again, that you're conveying the same mes message of your municipality um, out to not only your community members, your department leaders, um, but also your, uh, your citizens, the carriers. So when you're doing that, do you have a rep and do you have a standard about how that information is being conveyed to those various um, groups and various departments. When you turn around and you look at your external communication, in Aurora, again, we have one voice. When I have a question about small cell that goes into another department, I don't uh, pass that information on to the applicant or the carrier. I find that question out and I relay that back to my client on the outside. So that way we are keeping consistency and we're keeping that standard um, of what we want from the carrier as well as the carrier wanting from us. Establishing the, the goals of the carrier and what their priorities are is very important for building that relationship, um, internal and external, as well as your standards in a community, because again, they're hearing one consistent voice and they're getting that standard from you. It was mentioned in previous slides uh, that this was due on tax day. So it was a lot of fun that there was a little bit more that municipalities had to carry out. But again, you just wanna have that standard. And that's something that the city of Aurora is doing is we're always improving that standard, which goes into your process improvements. Don't be afraid to ask those carriers how we can do it better. That has been one of the best key pieces that I have felt that has been so successful in the city of Aurora is having that open dialogue to making a successful relationship for our process improvements, which we are still doing now. And part of that is making sure that our biggest fear with this is not falling flat and not having that shot clock pulled on us because we are not able to meet their expectations. If we find something wrong in our system that maybe we didn't notice uh, before or we hadn't tried it out before, having that transparency with them builds a better relationship. And we also ask them how they want to be informed when we are tolling the shot clock between reviews. Is it by email? Is it by um, you know the standard letter that they would like? We want their feedback because it's just as important. We also made sure that they understand when they're dealing with a third party, such as CDOT, we give conditional approvals and we want that approval to come back to us as part of their civil plan final review, which leads up to 
Aurora's standard. So this is really where we hang our hat as the city of Aurora and what I do at the very beginning, which is <clears throat> the pre-submittal site review. This is a courtesy review that all of our carriers and applicants understand that we do from the very start. This is either done in person, um, set up a meeting that they can bring in their, their counterparts, their engineers, or we can do it over the phone. But what I look for specifically is, one, do their Latin longs match the location that they are identifying that they want to put this small cell in? Importantly, is it in city right away? Is there a special easement, a handicap easement, um, you know, maybe a, a fire easement? Most importantly, it explains to them what we do here in the city of Aurora by having that transparency and wanting to build a relationship, explaining to them the benefit about placing or replacement of that light. One of the big things that we always explain to people is take your pen and that is your old infrastructure. And what they're putting in is now um, one of the water jugs. So does that right away fit with what they're wanting to put into your facility uh, infrastructure and your right away? And um, this is why it works for us is because they have that transparency of either revamping the location, moving it if it's not in the right away, and adjusting it before it goes to the shot clock quote unquote application um, begins then, which is the site review. And what we have here is an application table that is used in the city of Aurora. And that has specific um, bars and, and labels that we expect that comes from the carrier. So when we submit this and we use the Amanda system, um, which gives a simultaneous review, um, and with that, we explained to them that there are several departments that do the review, which is uh, your city planning, traffic, water, engineering, again, your real property. We are allowed two weeks for this review. And within that time, if there's a reason that they need to move it or they need to acquire a, a third party approval, they are informed in writing uh, with what their notes are. If everything is good, we move on to the civil plan review. In that review, it is a two one one, so two weeks for the first, one week and one week. And that, that third week is really a one week for your signature set. Once this review is completed, we issue addresses assigned by the city of Aurora. Um, we expect that the applicants are correcting what those notes or comments or concerns are, and they are clearly informed that we are tolling the shot clock each time. At this point in time, we at the same time at, that they're uh, going through their signature set, we are signing their site license agreement. That site license agreement is their one and two to apply for their public improvement um, permits. They have to have all of those pieces in order to apply for that permit because the site license is what lets them keep their infrastructure in our right-of-way. The permit is what gives them the permission to build it in our right-of-way. We want to make sure that we give them a general umbrella whether or not they are supplying their own power cabinets or that they need to um, run fiber to connect to a power source that is not one that doesn't belong to the city or doesn't belong to them we want to make sure that we have been very transparent in what we require and this for the city of aurora has fostered an amazing relationship with the carriers that not only are we able to be efficient in what we are delivering we are able to um, have that internal collaboration of expectations. So if somebody is not able to meet that bar or marker, internally we have educated and shared our expectations and built those standards as a team that when we have that question as a team, we send out one voice. And that's where it goes into being able to build that small cell 
and um, successfully complete it within the timeline and requirements uh, that we have set forth as the city of Aurora. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, we're going to go ahead and move into a time of q and I encourage um, you to open up your control panel on the right hand side and type in some questions um, before for. Uh, so I'm going to read it out loud the first question and it's directed at you, Jerry. Um, so it states, Jerry mentioned bonding for removal of abandoned facilities. Has there been success in getting that into ordinances? Is there template language? Uh, yes, there has been success. What I have relied on is um, the, the uh, bonding that the, the city will require often for the installation of uh, landscaping. And uh, as we all know, uh, we'll require landscaping bond. You have to require it to landscaping to survive for one year or two, whatever your local requirement is. And um, then you release that bond once it's held to have succeeded. Now, that's obviously not uh, applicable, but it's a it, it's the template of I, I've used to kind of um, rework that into a bond for a removal of the facility uh, at the termination of the use of the facility, and and I'm happy to uh, circulate that language uh, to the group. Uh, I realize there'd be some other things circulated afterwards, and I'm happy to provide it. Excellent, thank you, Jerry. Another question. Um, I Oh, go ahead. I, I would also add on that, Laurel, um, and for those who are on the call who are members of the CCUA, um, you already have this information, but it, in many communities in your general rights-of-way code, you have a bond section for any work that's done in the rights-of-way. Uh, the CCUA has a model uh, right-of-way code. It would deal with construction, whether it's trenching in the streets for wires or uh, for wireless facilities and basically any kind of construction in the rights of way where a bond is required uh, to protect uh, from any damages and for compliance with all provisions of that right of way code, which includes the obligation to remove abandoned facilities. Excellent. Thank you, Ken. Um, for our next question, this comes from Aurora. Are the are power cabinets part of the FCC shot clock rule? So if the power cabinets are required for the wireless facilities, they would be covered by the provisions of the FCC rules. Basically, that the power is included. In, so whether it's a power line or the box uh, or the meter, all of that is included under the rules if it's if it's necessary for the wireless site. Thank you, Ken. Uh, next up, we have another question for directed at Jerry, um, but any of our uh, speakers can speak to it. It says, "Are there examples of design standards for small and or rural towns?" Uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, yes, uh, at least I, I can say that what I have done is is taken um, uh, requirements I've written for larger communities and bearing in mind the size of the staff. And I really appreciate this question because so often we we conceive of solutions that would be great if you had five staffers to to do that and. You know, no pejorative to Aurora. I'm delighted that they are, you know, are have the approach that they have, and they they have the staff to be able to 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 implement it. But if you have a staff of four, a public works director, uh, a court clerk, a, a town clerk, and a manager, you you really need regulations that that you can you can administer with that staff. So I have yes, I've taken some regulations and and. Uh, streamline them as much as possible for for smaller communities and, and I'm happy to identify those as a part of the, the follow-up. Honestly, the uh, complexity that the FCC and to some extent 1193 uh, lay on us at the local level does not uh, recognize or take note of or respect the fact that you're laying requirements on 
communities with such a wide range of uh, staffing abilities, all the way from Aurora and Denver, Colorado Springs, uh, to Swink. And uh, it's not well thought out with that in mind, because it cannot be a one-size-fits-all a, a reaction to the law, and we do the best we can. But I, I certainly can um, make available the best I've been able to come up with, with small communities especially in mind. I would also like to add to that, um, I do agree. One of the big pieces that the city of Aurora has also done was ask for those SKU samples for rural communities um, if we have specific builds or limited build. Um, I would also state that when you're looking at small towns and limited staff, look at the fact of what the carriers can do for you. So are they willing to help, I don't know, maybe support a position um, temporarily, help with one of their consultants or engineers be able to donate to that town um, to be able to start putting that infrastructure in? And, um, you know, I think it's always good to uh, investigate what your opportunities are without making them seem steered one way or another. Um, so that's something that I would suggest that could also be brought to the table for smaller communities with uh, not as much asset or funding to be able to hire additional people. Um, so we've hit the hour mark, but we have a couple of leftover questions that I think we're going to address quickly. But if you have follow-up questions besides the next couple that we're going to ask, um, you can go ahead and contact um, any of the speakers that are on the screen in front of you, or you can email me here at the league, um, and we are happy to answer your questions. So we're just gonna go through a couple more before concluding. Um, so the next question says, uh, do the FCC fee limits apply to small cells installed on public property that is not located in the right of way? That's a really great question, and it's one of the areas of the FCC order that is not completely clear. Um, it, it's one of the issues that among the, the, the group of lawyers who are representing local governments around the country that are coordinating on um, uh, getting ready to brief these issues in the Ninth Circuit that um, we have we've talked about a little bit and it most of the order is is purported to limit to to the rights of way but there are pieces of it uh, where they're not and the FCC just really isn't clear there so I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer than that but I have to say I don't think so, but um, somebody on the industry side might read it differently. Uh, the next question is directed at Ken again. Um, can you clarify the $500 fee? Are those CAFs or safe harbor fees where you have to justify them if you go above $500? All right. um, another great question. So one of the things this order does, it, whether it's the fees or the aesthetic standards or the shot clock, they, it's not black and white that if you if you exceed it, you violate federal law. What it does is create legal presumptions. For the lawyers on this call, you know what those are. I'll just briefly, for the other folks, you know, you go into court, generally the plaintiff has to put on evidence to prove their case, and then the defendant has to put on evidence to counter it. A legal presumption ba basically means if a certain fact is in place, you don't have to put on evidence. You, you have, the plaintiff has proven their case. So if there was a challenge, to a jurisdiction whose fees were $2,000. And they said, this is what we need to recover our costs. And the industry didn't like it and they wanted to challenge you. They would go into court and they would say, their fees are above 500 bucks. And the court presumes that that violates federal law. And then the burden of proof shifts to the local government to demonstrate that it reasonably needs the $2,000 to recover all of its costs. So there is a chance that your fees can be justified. Um, on the other hand, um, you, you know, why, have, why do we have to go through the expense of defending ourselves in federal court to get to that point? I will say this to the industry's credit, um, I, and I would encourage all of you to do this. If your fees exceed $500, and most of them, most of you, that will be the case, I would, I would make it real clear as to how you calculate them and I would reach out to the industry, maybe even before they start filing applications, and say, heads up, our fees are more than 500 bucks. If you're interested in how we calculate them, we're happy to have a meeting with you and demonstrate that to you. And I think there is actually some 
honor or business ethics that those in the industry who negotiated our state law um, are acknowledging. And at least in the ones I've dealt with, they have said, okay, uh, you've shown us why your fees should be 2000 or 1200 or whatever it might be. Uh, we can live with that. Uh, so, uh, so I would encourage you to be proactive on that. Great. Thank you, Ken. Um, one final question before we conclude. Um, this one is directed at Leslie, um, but any of our speakers, of course, can answer. It says, how many small cell applications has Aurora had, and have you had to add staff and or how do you do you have staff dedicated to small cell applications? Thank you very much for the question. Um, Aurora has had a, approximately um, 35 applications for small cell, not including the power boxes and supplemental um, equipment that we've had to um, adjust with that. I am the new member for Small Cell. That is solely what I was hired to do, that and fiber installation. Um, we have other department heads that, that do support this role as part of their position. Um, so with those um, that approximate number of applications, so per application, the city of Aurora um, has 10 sites per application that we are processing through. So quite a bit is getting ready to go up and in on, on the city of Aurora side. Great, thank you, Leslie. Um, so I'd like to thank our presenters for sharing their knowledge with us today. And I'd like to thank you, our listeners, for attending. Once again, you'll receive the course ID for CLE credit by email this afternoon. And you can find the PowerPoint and the recording of this training on our website by the end of the week under training materials. Thank you all for joining us today. This concludes the webinar. Have a nice afternoon.